This is chapter 12, section 5, Alkenes and Alkynes. Now that we've learned about alkanes and cyclic alkanes and substituted alkanes, we can move on to slightly more complex organic compounds. The first ones we're going to look at are alkenes and alkynes. Ethene, C2H4, is an example of an alkene, which is actually a plant hormone that signals ripening and other growth processes in fruits such as bananas. So in this section, we're going to learn how to write the IUPAC names for these compounds, as well as learn about their structure and a little bit about their reactivity as well. Remember that in alkanes, all of the bonds between adjacent carbon atoms are single bonds. If we introduce a double bond between two adjacent carbon atoms, we end up with an alkene. If we introduce a triple bond between two adjacent carbon atoms, then that compound will be called an alkyne. Together, these are collectively called unsaturated hydrocarbons because they contain less than the maximum number of hydrogen atoms for the given number of carbon atoms. This means that you can also react them with hydrogen gas to reintroduce those missing hydrogen atoms back into the structure and turn them back into saturated alkanes. Remember, even for alkenes and alkynes, carbon atoms are always going to form four covalent bonds. It's just that now some of those will be double or triple bonds depending on the compound type. It's pretty easy to identify an alkene or an alkyne because you're just looking for a double or a triple bond between carbon atoms. In this example here, we see two carbon atoms connected by a double bond, and so this is clearly an alkene. Since there's just two carbons in this chain, we know that the prefix should be eth, the prefix for two carbons. And the ending of this compound is going to be ene, -E, which is the ending for alkenes. So instead of ethane for the alkane, we have ethene for the alkene. It's also important to notice that each of these carbons is double bonded to another carbon, which means they only have room for two more bonds to hydrogen atoms. That means that each of these carbons is only bonded to three other atoms, and with no lone pairs, that gives them a trigonal planar geometry. That means that all of the bond angles in this molecule are going to have the trigonal planar angle of 120 degrees. In this example, we see two carbons that are bonded through a triple bond. This is what makes this an alkyne. Since it's still a two carbon chain, we still keep the prefix ETH or eth, but now the ending is YNE for the alkyne. So it's ethine instead of ethane or ethene. Since these two carbons both have a triple bond to them already, the only other bond that they need is a single bond to another hydrogen atom to give them a total of four bonds. That means that each carbon is only has two atoms bonded to it and no lone pairs, which means that each carbon has a linear arrangement around it and that the bond angle here is 180 degrees. It's a straight line. So this molecule is actually linear from beginning to end. As you can probably guess from the previous examples, the naming system for alkenes and alkynes is very similar to the system for alkanes. In the case of the simplest molecules, the only difference is in changing the ending from A-N-E to E-N-E or Y-N-E. So you have ethane if it's an alkane, if there's a double bond it becomes ethene, if it's a triple bond it becomes ethine. Propane is the alkane, but if it has a double bond it's now propene, or if it has a triple bond it's propine. For longer alkenes and alkynes, we need a couple of more rules to ensure that we can come up with unique names for every possible structure. So take a look at this example. We see two different structures, both of which are alkenes because they both have double bonds, and they're also both four carbons long. So in order to distinguish them, we need to include a number to locate the double bond in the structure. For the one on the left, we can see that the double bond begins on the first carbon, and so it's called 1-butene. On the right, the double bond begins on the second carbon, and so it's called 2-butene. We also see an alternate naming system below where that number is placed right before the ending corresponding to that functional group. Either one is acceptable. So the double or triple bond is a real functional group in the sense that it changes the properties of the compound. It makes it different from just the typical alkane. 
And so to reflect this, we change the ending of the name from A-N-E to E-N-E in the case of a double bond or Y-N-E in the case of a triple bond. This is true of a lot of different functional groups that we're going to learn about in future chapters. For instance, an alcohol is a compound that has a functional group O-H, and alcohols have an O-L ending to their name. So one rule for any compound that contains an important functional group like this is that to identify the primary chain, you have to find the longest carbon chain that includes that functional group. So for an alkene, you have to pick the longest chain with the double bond in it. For an alkyne, it has to be the longest chain with the triple bond in it. Later on, we'll see that this also applies to other compounds. For example, again, the alcohol, you have to pick the longest carbon chain that has the OH group directly bonded to it. So it's a good idea to learn this rule now and get used to it because it'll be important later on as well. The best way to learn some of these rules is to just jump in and practice some examples. So let's take a look at these two. We're asked to find the IUPAC names for these two given structures. Now, usually we begin by looking for the longest carbon chain in the structure. But again, in the case where you have a specific functional group present, you have to make sure that you identify that group first because you need to find the longest carbon chain with that group in it. So it's important to be able to look at these structures and say this one is an alkene because it has a double bond and this one is an alkyne because it has a triple bond. That means that we have to include those double and triple bonds when we're identifying the longest carbon chain. For the first one, it's not a big deal because there's obviously only one chain from the beginning to the end, and it's this one. And so we can just find the end that's closest to the double bond. The double bond starts here, and so it's closest to this side. So we can begin with this is carbon number one, this is carbon number two, this is three, this is four, five, six, seven, and eight. We know that the prefix for eight is oct, and we know that this is an alkene, so the ending should be E and E for octene. Now we just need to include the number to locate that double bond. It begins on carbon three and goes to carbon four. So we only need to write the first number that it begins on, the lowest number. So it's three octene. An alternate way to write that would be oct dash three dash ene. Remember, no matter where you put the number, you always need to include a dash between the letters and the numbers. For this second example, it's a little bit trickier to identify the longest carbon chain. We can start with this carbon as one, and then something else we need to keep in mind is that since the arrangement through a carbon with a triple bond is linear, this is a carbon here, even though there's no turn in the line angle structure. For triple bonds, for alkynes, you're not always going to see a turn at that point. There'll be a, a straight line usually. So there's a carbon at the beginning, there's a carbon here, and then there's another carbon here where it makes the first turn. So this is carbon 2, this is carbon 3, then this is carbon 4. And then we have a choice. We can say 5, 6, 7, 8, or we can say 5, 6, 7. Since this number is higher, that means that that was the correct choice to take as the longest carbon chain, and this is actually octine. But we still aren't done. We need to first identify where the triple bond is, and then for account for the fact that we have this additional group attached. So to account for the location of the triple bond, we have to know that you start counting from the end closest to the triple bond. In this case, the triple bond begins right on this carbon, and so it's one octine. We can also see that this is a three carbon substituent attached to the fourth carbon in the main chain. Three carbon substituent is gonna be called propyl. It's attached to an end carbon, so it's regular propyl, it's not isopropyl. Uh, and it's attached to the fourth carbon, so it's 4-propyl. So this would actually be 4-propyl-1-2-3-4. Dash dash we can put the prefixes for the substituents in front just the way that we would for an alkane. We could again also name this 4-propyl-oct-1-ine. I'm going to make sure that's clear that that's a 1 and not an L. So these would both be acceptable names for this compound.
Let's look at two more examples. Remember, the first thing that we should do is try to identify any functional groups that are important for the name of these compounds. So again, here we have a double bond for an alkene, and here we have a triple bond for an alkyne. So we know that in this first case, these two carbons must be part of the longest chain that I find, and in the second case, these two carbons have to be part of the longest chain that I find. In the first example, we should just start counting at the end closest to the double bond so that we know we're counting the right way, and that would be this carbon, with number one. That would make this number two, this number three, this one number four, and then it doesn't really matter which of the other carbons you pick is number five, it'll be the same either way. So I'm just gonna go here and pick this as carbon number five. That means that this is pentene, but the double bond begins on carbon number two, so it's two pentene. Then we have to account for this substituent, the remaining methyl group that we didn't count as part of our main chain, and this is attached to the fourth carbon, so this is a four methyl group. That means we just put four dash methyl as a prefix to two pentene, four methyl two pentene. Or if we want to write it the other way, we could write four methyl pent dash two dash ene and place the two right before the ene ending. Either one of these is acceptable. In the second example, we really don't have any other substituents other than the triple bond. So it's just a matter of counting the, the carbon chain and then making sure that we're numbering it from the right end. So the triple bond is obviously closer to this end, so we would begin with this as carbon number one, this would be two, this would be three, this one would be four, this one would be five, and then this one would be six. So what we really have is hexine, a six carbon chain with a triple bond. The triple bond begins at the second carbon. That's the lowest carbon number it's attached to. And so it's really two hexine or alternatively hex two dash ine. Just like with alkanes, we can have alkenes that are in a closed cyclic structure. So these are cycloalkenes. Cycloalkynes are also possible, but because there's a linear geometry through the triple bond, they have to be much larger, and they're not as common as cycloalkenes, so we're not really gonna discuss them in this class. For cycloalkenes, you don't need to include a number for the location of the double bond. And that's because the double bond is always assumed to be between carbons one and carbons two. That's always the location of the double bond. You do need to include a number for any other substituents that might be in the structure. So in this example, we see that we have a five-membered ring with a double bond in it. So that's cyclopentene. No number is necessary to indicate the location of the double bond, the ene. But we do need a number to indicate the location of the methyl group. And here, the number is given as three, three methyl cyclopentene. So why is it three as opposed to, say, two or five or something else? Well. Hopefully we know that we should start counting at the double bond. So we could say that maybe this is carbon number one. If we try to count directly to the methyl group and say that this is carbon number two, we've already violated the first rule, which is that the double bond has to be between carbons one and carbon two. So that can't be the correct way. If this is carbon one, then this would have to be carbon two. If we continue counting in that direction, then it would mean that the methyl group is actually on carbon five and so it will be called 5-methylcyclopentene. However, if we take a look at a different system where we start with the other carbon in the double bond as carbon number one, then this carbon would have to be carbon number two, and this carbon would have to be carbon number three. Since that's the path that gives us the lower number for the methyl group, it gives us a three instead of a five, that's the counting system that we need to choose. So you have to use the numbering system that places carbon one and carbon two both in the double bond, but the direction of those and the way in which you count has to ensure that any other substituents get the lowest possible number. You can think about it as counting the shortest distance to the next substituent. Here are a couple more examples. In the first case, we have a six-membered ring with a double bond, and so we can say that it's cyclohexene. 
but we also have a chloro substituent that we need to locate. So we can either count this is carbon one and this is carbon two, which would place this at carbon six, or we could go in the opposite direction with this is carbon one and this is carbon two, which would place the chlorine at carbon number three. Obviously we want to choose the lower number, so that would make this three chloro cyclohexene. For the second one, we have a cyclopentene ring. It's a five-membered ring with a double bond, so it's cyclopentene. And again, to count the shortest distance to get to these two substituents, which is one and another methyl group, in other words, this is a dimethyl group, or it's two methyl groups, we would count this is carbon number one, this is carbon number two, and then this would be carbon number three. Now be careful because we haven't seen yet two identical groups attached to the same carbon. So you might say that this is just three dimethyl cyclopentene, but this is not quite correct. Since there are two groups indicated by the di, two methyl groups, we need a number for each of them. Even if it's the same number because they're attached to the same carbon, we have to write them explicitly. So instead of just three dimethyl, we have to write three comma three dash dimethyl cyclopentene. 